Thank you very much, Marcelo. As uh, Neil Ferguson has pointed out to you, we now have three <coughs> trials on PEEP in ARDS. Uh, we have the alveoli trial, we have the Canadian love trial, and we have the express trial from France. And all three of these trials show no significant benefit in patients with ARDS. And if we look here in terms of mortality, there is no difference in mortality with the three trials. When uh, these three trials were first uh, published, I was asked to editorialize on them according to the theme of why do the three trials make me a more confident clinician and to explain my, why I felt it made me a more confident uh, clinician I need to be back, back a little bit and explain to you uh, my approach to the practice of medicine which basically deals with what so part, sort of knowledge do I think I know and to what extent can I feel confident about that sort of knowledge. And basically in medicine there are two main routes to knowledge or knowing. One is realism and the other is probabilism and empiricism. Up to the end of the 18th century, medical theory consisted largely of mere speculation. Then with the French Revolution, uh, in Paris, a group of physicians developed an anatomical theory of disease which was based on meticulous autopsy studies and clinical pathological correlation. This, uh, these physicians operated as philosophical realists because their goal was to discover mechanisms of disease. This revolutionary approach spread rapidly across Europe and particularly to Germany where it was enhanced uh, by physiological studies and also expanded to include studies of basic pathology and microbiology. So all of these physicians, ana anatomists, physiologists, pathologists and microbiologists were philosophical realists who aimed to discover the mechanisms of disease. A fundamentally different epistemological base to <coughs> medicine and knowledge is probabilism. And probabilists fu are fundamentally not convinced by the ontological positions and assumption of the realists. And these are the assumptions of what really exists in the world and what is the true nature of things. And instead, probabilists, and particularly trialists, pay greater attention to statistical associations between observed, observed uh, phenomena. And through statistics, the probabilists hope to be able to predict future events. As a clinician, I try to keep a foot in both the realist and probabilist camps. And if gaining uh, confidence as a clinician were based solely on randomized controlled trials, I would have had to wait until 2000 before using a lower tidal volume to try and avoid ventilator-induced lung injury. But the animal studies that appeared from Dreyfus and several other groups in the mid-1980s were far too disturbing to ignore. And when I wrote a, a review article in the New England Journal back in 1994, I pointed out that it was important to lower tidal volume down to 5 to 7 ml per kilogram and to keep the plateau pressure no higher than 35. And these recommendations were not based on any randomized control trial, but likewise they were not based on a whim. They were based on physiological reasoning. And now we have these three studies that have been discussed by Neil in some detail, but let's look at further details of these three studies that suggest that PEEP is unhelpful. Uh, the two later trials differ in some detail from the alveoli study, but the general principles are the same for all three randomized controlled trials. If we look here in the aim of the alveoli study, it's to determine whether the use 
of higher PEEP levels would improve clinical outcomes. The term whether the use of is very broad and general. And if we look in terms of what constitutes a good hypothesis, uh, Edward O. Wilson has pointed out that the characteristics of a good scientific hypothesis are parsimony, generalizability, consilience, and predictiveness. So if we look at how these four characteristics apply to the three trials of PEEP, and first beginning with the alveoli study. So here, parsimony means that the fewer the phenomena used to account for a hypothesis, the better. So if we look at the table in the alveoli study, which is the identical table applied by the love study, they tested one arm of this table versus the other arm. Well, this table is very broad with complex permutations and combinations. It's the antithesis of parsimony. And the second factor in uh, Wilson's list is generalizability, also referred to as external validity, which is the ultimate goal of research. And we can see in the alveoli study that patients were enrolled from 23 hospitals. And something that a large number of study sites ne necessarily enhances generalizability. But this is a misconception, and it's, uh, the, it's resulting from the type of thinking involved in t undertaking Gallup studies, whereas in science, generalizability, and in biology, is based instead on scientific knowledge and insight, rather than on statistical representativeness. RCTs are thought to provide a facsimile of everyday clinical practice. The RCT design is believed to capture how physicians truly manage patients. So how true is this belief? So again, if we look at the table from the alveoli study, it's when we look at the table as shown in the New England, it's very hard to digest. And here I, I'm using the exact same table, but I've simplified it. And you can see that if the FiO2 was 0.6, physicians in the low arm got a PEEP of 10, and physicians in the high arm got a PEEP of 20, with no alternatives. If the FiO2 was 0.8, they either got a PEEP of 14 or a PEEP of 22, with no options to change those settings. So to me, if, if, if an FiO2 is 60, I can't imagine any experienced intensive care physician who would think that it makes sense to set the PEEP either at 10 or 20 with no alternative. So as such, these RCTs bear no resemblance to what is reality for physicians. As such, they lack internal validity and thus can provide no generalizability. The third factor on Wilson's list is consilience, meaning that the processes should conform with already solidly verified knowledge. So if we look again at the pressure volume curve in patients with ARDS, some people have said that setting the level of PEEP above the lower inflection point might protect against the development of ventilator-induced lung injury by preventing shear stresses. Again, if we return to the table from the alveoli study, we can see that it's impossible to gain any insight into the importance of the lower inflection point because the high PEEP arm included an option to select a PEEP level of 5, which is below the lower inflection point. So the final item on uh, Wilson's list is predictiveness, which is the hallmark of a good hypothesis. So if the prediction being tested in the alveoli arm is that the use of arm A versus arm B will result in higher average values of PEEP in arm B, then the study is very clear cut. In both the alveoli study and the LOF study, the use of that table did result in higher levels of PEEP. But in undertaking research, there are two desiderata 
of inquiry that we want to achieve. One is to discover truths or reality, but then not just any old truths. We want truths that are important. So for example, if I make a prediction, when it rains, a large bucket will collect more water than a small bucket. Well, who cares? Nobody wants to know the answer, okay? And it's an awful lot easier to find truths if you don't mind whether the truths you get are being trivial. And this fundamental importance in science is completely ignored by EBM. And so for both the alveoli study and the love study, everything hinges on whether the table constitutes a critical experiment. And in terms of parsimony, generalizability, consilience, and predictiveness, the table does not constitute uh, an, a critical experiment. So <clears throat> the express study differed somewhat from the other two studies. So let's look at this. And in contrast to the alveoli and love study, the hypothesis is parsimonious in the express uh, study. They tested a clear prediction. Increases in PEEP to achieve a plateau of 28 will increase survival. And the plateau of 28 was a compromise between trying to achieve recruitment and avoiding over distension. And while 28 is a reasonable guess, there's nothing magical about 28. We've known for decades that the response to PEEP is very variable. And this here we see studies from Ruby showing that some patients develop over distension with as little PEEP as 10. And then as has been pointed out uh, in the Gatinoni study, others showed little re-aeration despite airway pressures of 45. So the express study is characteristic of most ICU uh, RCTs and that is that no attempt was made to determine the individual characteristics of each patient. In each arm, every patient was treated the same. So in terms of probabilism, which is the basis of the RCTs, probabilist focus on statistical associations between observed phenomena. Probabilists aspire only to the demonstration of relationships, not to understanding their cause and effect. And probabilistic uh, reasoning and findings are not connected to the corpus of uh, biomedicine. There's no location within the EBM framework to insert knowledge of pathophysiology. So every lab scientist knows that methodological problems can lead to erroneous conclusions. And the same applies to RCTs. The idea of a hierarchy of evidence with RCTs at the apex is contrary to the most elementary understanding of the epistemology of science. Instead, study design is a matter of courses for courses. The optimal design depends on the research question being posed. There never will be one single research design that is the right cho choice for every situation. For some questions, RCTs may be the best design, such as undertaking a large phase three drugs trial. But for other questions, RCT is on in a inappropriate design because it's unable to do the heavy lifting involved in capturing how physicians iteratively titrate P in real life. So in conclusion, I return to the question posed at the beginning. Why do the three trials make me a more confident clinician? From the French Revolution onwards, physicians have been aware that medicine needs to be based on understanding of mechanisms of disease. Medicine is too complex a discipline and our covenant to patients too sacred to be swayed by the latest fashion, however much the purveyors push their wares. We cannot exclude patients from the benefit of new knowledge while awaiting approval from self-appointed authorities who believe their methodology is based on gold. Scientific knowledge is cumulative 
aggregated over centuries. And when faced with a new potential entry on our crossword, not only do the data need to be sound, they also need to cohere with the entries filled in by generations working on the crossword before we were born. I cautioned at the beginning that probabilism was a variant of gambling, but in truth, I'm a gambler at heart. And the reason the three RCTs made me more confident as a clinician is that long ago, I placed my money on these guys rather than an any self-proclaimed gold standard. Thank you. Physiology, if you increase peak, there are beneficial effects and detrimental effects. And how do you balance those? Because many of us have different, different answers to the same question about the, the detrimental effects, if you like. So how do you get that at within this, your framework? Right. I mean, obviously, as I mentioned, you need to balance, as you say, physiology and the RCTs. But when you undertake an RCT, you must be sure that the RCT is capable of answering the question. Right. And the problem here is if you're undertaking RCTs, comparing high and low PEEP, then in the two arms you need to be able to incorporate how physicians actually apply them. And certainly, the application is not when the FiO2 is 60, that your PEEP is either 10 or 20. I mean, right. these are the that problems. Was, that was my question. It wasn't balancing RCT versus physiology. It's balancing physiology. Balancing higher PEEP can have detrimental effects, it can have beneficial effects. And how you decide that, because we don't know all the, all the impacts uh, in a single patient. How do you actually decide that? Well, I mean, obviously we're dealing in a whole realm of uncertainty and ignorance. I mean, at the bedside, we're doing best uh, guess scenarios. I mean, we're applying uh, PEEP cognizant of the dangers of too low a lung volume, too high a lung volume, and we don't have the tools today to be able to do that in a very succinct manner. So all we're doing is kind of an iterative approach as best we can, but clearly there's no particular targets that we have yet identified that can guide us in that. Questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Martin.